Okay, so this is Jim Groom, DTLT Today, and I seem to be alone on the cuddle couch. Uh, and that's a sad day for me, because usually I'm surrounded by all the other people in DTLT, but um, they're not here. They've abandoned me. That's not true. And we're not alone. Actually, today we're lucky. We're lucky because we have a Arizonian, an Arizonian, which when I was in California in the 90s, they called them Zonies. And I don't know how Arizona people feel about being called a Zoni, but um, we have actually Shelly Rodrigo, who's from Mesa Community College. She teaches media and rhetoric. She's an assistant professor. And she's coming to us actually not from Arizona. She's actually spending the year in, you know, the first commonwealth, the beginning of this great nation, Virginia, right? <laughs> she's at Old Dominion University, and she's here with us today, and we're going to talk to her about what the hell she's doing in Virginia and a couple other things she's been a part of. And I was fortunate enough to meet Shelley for the first time at the um, Maricopa Teaching and Learning Conference back in May, and that was a blast. And I got to see just how many people and great people they have on the ground there in Arizona. So we'll be talking to Shelly today. Shelly, welcome. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so I'm in a weird situation today here, Shelly, because I actually can't see what's happening on the screen. So I'm going to go for my cues okay. from Tim Owens, who's producing today. Um, so Shelly, let me ask you this. You've had an extensive career and experience in teaching online. And uh, you've done that a lot at Mesa, right? And you've yes. even done it at Arizona State University, from what I understand? Yeah. So yes. let me ask you. Over 10 years. You have all that experience. I'm very interested in that. So let me start there, and then we'll move on to why you're in Virginia. So for you, with online education, right, I've only started dipping my foot into it recently in Martha Burtis with this DS-106, this Digital Storytelling 106. For you, what's the key to teaching well online? For you, not, you know, some general textbook. What do you think is the key and has been the key in your experience? Um, I think the important thing is to remember why the student is taking that class in that modality. Um, don't get me wrong. There are some students who take it because it's the only thing that fit in their schedule, meaning that they're face-to-face -face students, they're enrolled full-time at some institution, and then they cram in one more course. Uh, but increasingly, and even at four-year institutions who have a large face-to-face -face population, increasingly we're seeing more and more students who online, for whatever reason, is the way that it works for them, whether they're at a distance, which was historically kind of the pitch for online learning, right? But also we, we just see a growing number of people who are working uh, full-time most of the time. I, I find most of my students... Uh, as I like to say, it have their brain fart moment when they register because they're working full time <laughs> and try to take classes full time. Exactly. <laughs> and there becomes a breakdown. But that being the case, back to my original comment of remembering why my students are there. They're there because this is the only way they can get the class. And whether, for whatever reason, that's the only way they can get the class, I have to accept that, that moment when they're in my class, that is the reason, and to try to work with that. And so things... For me, that has meant um, support, trying to be very uh, accessible, and whether that access is email, phone, Skype, Google Chat, meeting face-to-face, -face, uh, I've done that all to support my online students. But the tough thing, and I'm sure this will freak out some viewers, the, the toughest thing I have is deadlines. Uh, just recognizing, again, that for so many of these students that they're doing this because their lives are already jam-packed and they're okay meeting deadlines barely <laughs> um up to the point that there's a oh my gosh moment in their life something happens whether uh work changes their schedule or the boss says they have a big project that's due in two weeks or a child or a parent figure or some other family member or good friend gets seriously injured and all of a sudden that full-time job and full-time classes has left no space for that crisis moment uh, and so that's where i really struggle is that helping students through that point because whether it happens at the beginning of the semester the middle of the semester and the end of the semester having this moment of oh this happened and trying to allow them to still finish the class because i feel like the worst thing i can do 
is to say, I'm sorry, your dog died. I don't have children. I have pets. So to me, they are my children. But the worst thing I feel like I can do is, I'm sorry, your dog died. You missed the deadline because you were at the vets all night last night. Eh, you lose those points. Yeah. I, I just don't think that's fair. Um, but that does mean uh, I, I grade a lot of revise and resubmit. <laughs> or a lot of work. Now, let me ask you this, um, though. Because one of the questions that comes up out of that, and it's interesting to me, and you know, I think we all right now in this moment face it, is you know, we have a situation in a cultural moment where you have students, you know, non-traditional students, even traditional students, I think, who have mm -hmm. to work far more than they may have in the past. Yes. And they have to do far more work exactly. on top of the school. And so you have these competing interests. And this idea right. of going to school and why we go to school, um, whether or not we want to look at this in the face or not, you know, people are doing it for obvious reasons to better their lives to get this degree. But at what point might we all, not any one person, but what might we all be compromising some of the process? And that's a whole question. Like, is the process pure and now we're compromising it because it's made unpure by it? I don't know. I mean, I'm not trying to say that, but I mean, at what point do we realize that, you know, there is this kind of schizophrenia among students between actually making money to do this extremely expensive thing like going to school and what's become a privilege and how do we culturally deal with that whether it be more funding whether it be the idea that maybe university isn't required for everyone to get more money and a better job I mean or just some different reimagined way for thinking about that online university so it's not about deadlines and hey my dog died are you gonna dock me these points but there's a more mm -hmm. fluid way at it. Any ideas on that? But Just because all those questions you bring up are huge and everyone faces them. Absolutely. Well, I think part of what you're talking about, kind of the worth of doing this and how it conflicts with time has similarly gotten me to really think about what are the objectives of my course? What is it I want students yeah. to have learned at the end of the course? Um, the, those big questions about why are they here, what what bang for their buck are they getting has really got me to rethink my course objectives and whether, um, for example, in the Maricopa District, which Mesa is one of ten schools, our class objectives, our course objectives are given to us. Now, I, I thankfully uh, helped participating in, in rewriting the English 101, 102 objectives, and so those I feel pretty comfortable with. But, for example, I've accepted that one unwritten objective in all my classes and I'm up front with my students about it whether it's face to face or online is you will become more techno literate. Yeah. I, I pitched the sale of in this, you know, day and age, this is a skill that I think will benefit you and most of them agree. And then I'm like, and you're gonna, you know, bang your head against technologies in this class, but I, I promise you you survive. Uh, you will be more comfortable and confident in these different environments and when another class or a job throws and says, hey, you need to learn this uh, after having been through my class, you will not freak out in that moment. You'll be like, no, I can do this and, and move on from there. Uh, but that, why I'm bringing it to technology is that that's one of the major reasons I have found myself not teaching in LMSs. Yeah. Because... In, in the world, according to Shelley, they're useless after college. Yeah. No, no work environment, well, very few work environments actually use Blackboard. But if I have my students learning how to do stuff in WordPress or in Google Docs or building wikis, these are all technologies that they can actually use, transport with them, um, and resemble technologies they're more likely to use um, post degree yeah and you give them and I love that idea and this I mean that's come up again is this idea of the LMS as a kind of you know that's useful for when you're in school and learning how to do school but the idea of how easy it would be for those technologies to penetrate all around your experience in your life and framing students with a space that's their own and that they become comfortable with that will kind of translate seamlessly into the world I mean I love that approach and I love your also approach that look one of the things that's unwritten but it's apparent is what they'll be learning in this class is how to get comfortable with technology because many of them are not even though there's this kind of myth about digital natives or even returning students that's an unevenly mm -hmm. developed frontier and we can't Absolutely. take it for granted well I, I, I have to admit that digital natives immigrants uh, 
metaphor I really li uh, dislike. Um, I really stand by Mark Milliron's uh, belting metaphor. So talking about that people work through, like in martial arts, work through different layers of belts. Yeah. Uh, and, and I like that because uh, like little kids in belts, you, <laughs> part of me thinks it's because they're lower to the ground and they fall and get back up easier, but they move through those lower levels really, really quickly. Um, but when you get to the different layers of black belts, that takes a degree of experience, time, wisdom. And that's part of, I think, the distinction of technology users. So it's not necessarily immigrants and natives, even though as someone who teaches English and can sit there and talk about ESL and how that metaphor maybe might work, um, I really like the belting metaphor because I think, yeah, some people can move really quickly through those brightly colored belts, but as they get to the higher level ones, you have to slow down. It's kind of the nature of the process. Yeah, and the nuance and complexity of how networks truly work and how to theorize Absolutely. how they work and how that's going to impact what you do and what we're all doing culturally. I mean, that's why, you know, that is, I agree with you, like when you start getting into those nuances, you're getting into the higher levels of examining what exactly, I'm not going through root process. Something's happening right. to me in turn. And to understand right. that through reflection is, is remarkable. So it, let me ask you It this. reminds me of this great conversation I had with Alan Levine, Cog Dog. Who's the um, Alan Levine? Uh, RSS. Oh, yeah. That RSS is one of the markers. If, if you really understand and get RSS, yes, <laughs> you've moved up to a exactly. belt. You might black belt. That's one of the belts you pass. And it should be orange. <laughs> And it should have little, like, syndication waves on it, right? <laughs> Absolutely. But it's interesting because trying to get people to understand that, it's like, that's, that's the way Facebook works. If you get that, you understand it. Um, and I think another one is right. I think that would be right. And another one for me, and I do this all the time this week, particularly I'm going back into classes at Mary Washington, Creative Commons. Mm -hmm. The idea of yes. attribution. The idea of the complexity of copyright with all this stuff right now. It's another one, so I really like that. The belting metaphor does work. Oh, that, that would be fun. We need to create and the, the, thing the is, it's colored also, belts and what they mean. Yeah, you could create a great video game around that, right? Because there was, like, remember Kung Absolutely. Fu video when you went in and, like, you kicked everybody's ass and you had the knife and, like, you know, that would be a great, like, ed tech Kung Fu get my belt video game. I love yeah, it. So that's a good one. <laughs> okay, so let me ask you this. You're out in Arizona, doing your thing out there in the desert, Mesa College, Arizona State, and then you find yourself in this lush, green, East Coast country known as Virginia, down on, you know, basically the birthplace of North America in terms of colonial North America, right near Yorktown, Jamestown. You're at Old Dominion University, and you're there for the year, am I right, Shelley? Yes, I'm here for the year. So now, are you a spy sent by the West to find out how good we do it on the East Coast? Or are you actually <laughs> here to show us what to do, to show us the way? What's going on? Well, um, Old Dominion's English department, two faculty who specialized in new media, technology, technical writing, um, were hired into other positions rather late in the hiring cycle last spring. And so the department had very last-minute uh, spot to fill, especially they, they have a relatively young uh, PhD program that has a heavy emphasis in new media. Uh, so, and I was, I was due for a sabbatical. I've been full-time at Mesa for nine years. Wow, and uh, so they, they made my, I have some friends here in the department and I got an email saying, what do you think about a year of visiting associate professor at Old Dominion playing rhetoric in new media? Ooh, sounds good. Um, so it's it is spying. I will say I will say this. It is spying. Going back to the first part of the conversation, in my ten plus years of online learning, it's primarily been asynchronous. Yeah. Old Old Dominion has a very robust synchronous yes. online program, yes. including the English department's PhD program. Huh. Uh, so this semester, for example, I'm teaching a graduate class. It's a master's level, but I have both master's students and PhD students, some students face-to-face, -face, about six or seven in the class face-to-face, -face, and another five or six online for three hours a week. And so that, on some level, is uh, me spying for Mesa and Maricopa because uh, at least Mesa has definitely built a very robust 
asynchronous yeah. online program. And I think there's definitely something to synchronous programs as long as, to me, the important thing, as long as students know in advance. Yeah. Because the whole point of them taking this, pro you know, back to my reason I was saying is that they're taking it because it doesn't fit in their schedule. Well, as long as they know, you know, I have to be online Tuesdays, 7 to 10, uh, that's fine. That's one so thing. So I'm going to do a little spying right now for Mary Washington over at ODU, sure. thanks to you. So when you do bring in those five or six uh, students for the synchronous class, and you're physically in a class or some sort of studio, I imagine, at ODU, how does that work? Actually, that's a great question, and um, I'm negotiating that right now. Uh, the building next to the English department building, so I'm kind of tossing my hand out, <laughs> out the window, um, has these beautiful studio classrooms uh, that have those setups where there's cameras, and if you pu push the little microphone, the camera zooms in. Um, however... Uh, the English department has decided that they did not like using those classrooms, and they're just using, right now, uh, online meeting software. Uh, WebEx is what's being supported. The institution has Adobe Connect. Um, since the class I'm teaching right now is teaching writing online, or teaching writing with technology. There we go. Yeah. Teaching writing with technology. I already forewarned the students, we're going to play in all these things. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try to get us over in uh, one of those lab spaces. But I, I can't answer your question very well because I'm still tinkering with it. But uh, I'd love to get back to you at the end of the semester and share the process. So last week and this week, we're going to be in Adobe Connect, uh, maybe one more week. We're definitely going to play in... Um, Google Hangout, the Google Plus Hangout for a couple weeks. You know what we should do, Just, Shelley, you know what we should do? We should do a field trip down to ODU for one of your classes. This will be DTLT Today's On the Road field trip. I love and it. And we'll take the, our, our setup, because we've been experimenting with video just like this, our setup mm -hmm. and see if we can't reproduce the studio effect with DTLT Today for a synchronous live show how we might do it. Now, I'm, I don't want to volunteer anyone here for anything they don't want to do, but I'd be very interested to get a tour of those studios, see how they're doing online learning at ODU, and then see what tools we have and how we could reproduce, reproduce in a classroom something like that without Adobe Connect or Illuminate, which yes. makes me want to puke on the floor. <laughs> well, and that's exactly what uh, I'm struggling with. And uh, what's interesting is that at least thus far with the PhD students, they have definitely set up um, a requirement, if you will, of a video connection that the PhD students explicitly say, we, we want visual connection yeah. to the group. So yes, I'm, I too am playing with it. Uh, I, I may try, Skype I think you have to purchase to have the multiple. Yeah, um, it's like eight bucks a month. Yeah. I actually did purchase it. And I, I've, I already have, uh, I can call out on Skype, which I love. Uh, so I, you know, it's one of those things, okay, drop in the bucket, I'm going to test this. So I may do that as well. But that's exactly it. Um, I can say, I wish I had the ability to say, sure, come on down. But the one thing I miss being at a new institution, if this were Mesa, I, I would be like, because I'm in the CTL I, or the Center for Teaching and Learning at Mesa uh, for the past four years, obviously not this year. Yeah. Um, I've had various amounts of reassigned time. Four years ago, I was instructional technologist, completely reassigned time for one year, and then various amounts of uh, professional developer, but integrated enough in it that without even talking to them, I'd be like, sure, come down, we'll plan it. At ODU, yeah. I'm just starting to That's make right. those You're just brand new, yeah. No, but that's interesting, and it should be exciting. I still have to, when I call IT for help, I have to go through the first 10 sets of questions. Be No, no, really, I tried all that stuff first. I'm not a complete techno goob. Well, what know? I think is really interesting, Shelley, is that it took you coming here from Arizona and me meeting you through Maricopa and Allen to actually get that kind of spark to say, why don't we know more about what ODU is doing? Because they have been leading the way in terms of Virginia with synchronous online learning, like yes. you've said. And I couldn't tell you the first thing about how they do it. So it's interesting to me. So I, I will say this. They have the most beautiful studio. Uh, when I did orientation two weeks ago now, um, and I walked into this room, and I was like, oh, really? <laughs> what is this, all of this? It's awesome. Uh, they have a beautiful studio set up that is 
not not just the classrooms that are studios, but they have a full studio that is just basically an empty room, about a classroom size room, that it looks like they can do just about anything in. Amazing. Uh, so again, I'm I'm looking forward to trying to do something. <laughs> okay. So let me ask you this now. We're running at 15 minutes, so I want to finish up this um, interview with asking you a little bit, and I already dedicated to blog about it, so I'm going to steal what you say to start my blog. When I was out of Maricopa in May, I did the presentation, met all the folks at Maricopa, it was a great day, but at the end of the day, we all broke out, and I came to something which Alan informed me is called the Cyber Salon. For our yes. viewers out there, can you explain what the Cyber Salon is, how it started, and really what it might, may mean for professional development moving forward? Absolutely. Uh, Cyber Salon is a group of people who meet that is modeled after historically the literary and intellectual salons that we usually associate with um, England, uh, especially during, uh, I want to say the Enlightenment. I'm, my history is really bad. Uh, but England and France, um, writers in France? Ugh, I'm blanking. But Literary, I usually, I come from an English, English literature background, so literary salons, but there was also intellectual salons. And sure. so based on those, I, about four or five years ago now, I forgot, we've been doing it a while, uh, I started Cyber Salon with the idea, the core idea was we would meet once a month. The requirements would be at the location we met is that they served alcohol, served food, and there was wireless access. <laughs> Right. And the, the purpose of it, like those salons, was just for people who were interested in, you know, technology, geeky things, to have time to spend together and talk and share. Uh, some cyber, sal cyber salons are very focused. We'll do a specific thing, like once uh, there was a digital photography one that we actually did at um, the botanical gardens and then went somewhere out. Afterwards, uh, last spring, I did a mobile day one. Uh, a lot of them, though, just take place at either someone's house or a pub or a restaurant. And we, you know, sometimes it's small groups, four or five people. Other times we've had over 20 to 30 people show up. Yeah. What's really fun is the, the vast majority of the people who come are educators. Um, however, we've got people who weave in who are just... Um, interested kind of geeks in the area. Uh, for a while we had um, a lawyer who came regularly. He actually moved out of town and that's why he doesn't come anymore. Um, we're, we have a growing number of some administrative and um, even assistant figures who come and and hang out. It, it what What's happened is that people find it's the, their most robust and productive professional development because it happens in a more casual environment. Okay. Uh, can talk about failure. Uh, that, that sometimes is, is important somehow, to have an environment where you can be like, I tried this and it bombed. And it's somehow extra or, institutional too, right? Like it's not associated with one any or any institution. It's just folks no, that it is not anywhere can come. And there's an anyone online can component not too. Yeah, um, and I think that's, what, what was, what's been interesting is in the past two years, um, a handful of administrators from different campuses on, in the Maricopa district have joined the listserv. So also cyber salons on the listserv. Yeah. Um, and that has had some interesting ramifications in terms of the listserv discussions. Um, and a sense that people feel like they're getting watched. Like, here's, yeah. here's the admins. we got to watch what we say about Johnny a X or Y. Absolutely. absolutely. Well, or, or actually what, what happened is that um, because for a while it was so open and people weren't worried about it, and a vast majority of the people were from the Maricopa district, so sometimes very specific questions would come up about Maricopa. Um, and, you know, sometimes it was like, oh, I can't figure this out, or why, why do we do it this way? You know, some negative connotation. Sure. And once I started to realize that there was these administrators, and actually I had a great conversation with um, my chief academic officer who one day told me, he goes, oh, yeah. He goes, that's one of the things I read daily. He goes, other emails will wait. I skim that because that is, for me, a pulse of what 
a certain group of, of, of teachers in, in the college and the district are doing. So, I mean, that's a fascinating insight from his perspective. But once he said that to me, I was like, ooh. And I actually had to have uh, one list mama moment where I'm like, okay, everyone, I'm going to quickly remind you that's right. <laughs> who's that's on right. here. You know, some people are not from Maricopa, so keep that in mind. Uh, we do have some administrators um, who rarely ever post, but they're there. <laughs> A couple of documented sex offenders. <laughs> no <I'm> kidding. <laughs> well, I can say I did have one member who said, um, are, are her archives public because da, 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 I've been stalked by someone? And I'm like, uh, yeah, do we want to get you on with a pseudonym? Exactly. <laughs> No, so that I love, I mean, I love the whole idea. And what I really liked, when I saw it when I was in Phoenix, was the way in which there were like 20 people at that one, and it was like a party. People Absolutely. hanging out, people drinking, talking about the stuff. I got to sit down with Dustin and find out all the awesome stuff he's doing. Right. Um, it was Absolutely. really a great model for professional development that didn't feel like anything but meeting people and having fun. So Right. I think what... I, I think what led me to this path was in graduate school, I had a graduate writing group, and we realized really quickly, we were very active for four plus years, we realized very quickly that we would not get things done, or we would back out of our meetings if we didn't meet over food. Because the kind of the idea was we were going to eat anyways. We were going to eat lunch anyways, or we were going to eat dinner anyways, or occasionally we met for breakfast. We were going to eat one of those meals anyways. So if we met to work, do the workshopping, the you know, course writing, dissertation writing, workshopping. If we met over a meal, we'd be killing two birds with one stone. And I think that was one of the things that definitely drove me with Cyber Swan and the importance of food. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a bunch of teachers. Maybe it's just In you know a writing teacher. We write lots of papers. Alcohol. And and um, uh, and, uh, and lampshade access to Wi-Fi. Now we have this. We're just about going to close up, but I don't want to ignore. Jason Green had a question in the chat. So before we close, this is a question from Jason Green in the on the cat in the chat, and he was asking: To what extent do you think synchronous online expands access versus cannibalizing the regular classroom? So does the expansion of synchronous online course really kind of, like he says, cannibalize the face-to-face -face we're having on-site. Um, so what do you think? That's a question. Um, any, any opinions? Uh, my, my gut says that the vast majority of the time it cannibalizes it. Uh, the vast majority of the time, say, for example, uh, th this would happen in the community college, that I really want to teach, I actually had an action narrative class, I really want to teach this action narrative class, and it would never make face-to-face. -face. There just wasn't enough interest face-to-face. -face. But if I did it face-to-face -face and online, the course might make. And when that's kind of the motivating factor, um, I, I think it gets cannibalized because a lot of times the instructor, if that's what drove them to do it, then they're probably not being very creative about how they're meshing together these modalities. Yeah. Um, and I'll even say I did it once, and it was abominable. I did do a, it, it was more of a face-to-face -face slash asynchronous online, and whew, I, I, I mean, I feel confident students learn things, but I look back on it, and I'm like, oh, wow, I would do that radically different. Now, in a, in a scenario like this, this graduate program where that's part of the only way they're getting to these classes, right. um, I, think, I think then what's the key is that your instructors buy into it, and by buying into it, they take seriously that this needs to matter, this needs to count, this needs to be done well. And a lot of times, and that's where something like a cyber salon comes in handy, a lot of times you're just sitting there scratching your head going like, how am I going to do this? And having people to talk to and go like, here's an idea I'm having, what do you think? Do you think that might work? What technology might I use to facilitate that? Um, that I miss that group right now. I have them online, but I, I miss the the monthly meetings. That's right, you're aware. Uh, for, well, hopefully yeah. we can have you up to Fredericksburg soon and uh, at least reconnect you with some people who you are familiar with. Absolutely. But it was a pleasure having you on the show today, Shelley. Thank you for taking the Thank time out to talk me. to us. And uh, good luck at ODU. And we hope Thank at some you. point we get to see your, your digs at, down there. Oh, actually, I can show you. What, what's humorous is 
that my office is extremely empty. Empty bookshelves, empty walls. I do have a poster I need to, a framed poster I need to bring in here. Uh, but I, I love my office. I have a great window, which I didn't have at Maricopa or Mesa, but <laughs> I'm slowly settling. Yeah. Well, welcome. Virginia is the light. Thank you. Take care. You too. Everyone have a great day. You too. Thank you.